All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. You guys on the line, I've got Ben Freeman from the Quincy Institute. And he's got a new one out for responsiblestatecraft.org called Gulf Funded Think Tank Turns Pro-Saudi UAE Messaging Up to 11. All about the Middle East Institute here. Uh, Welcome back to the show, Ben. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be here again. Uh, Great to have you on. And you know what? It's just great to uh, have your acquaintance here. You are the best guy I know. And there's a few like this. But you're the best guy I know on just watching like a hawk, these foreign lobbies and their spending in this country to influence the Congress and especially the think tanks and the way you do. And, you know, our last interview was about Ukraine and how much money they've been spending. Of course, that's all American tax money anyway, but recycled into public relations campaigns in America and this kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. of course the Israel lobby and the Saudi lobby. And, and here comes the Saudis again. And, you know, I think probably a lot of Americans would be surprised to know that these so-called think tanks that they hear about on NPR news or whatever, that these are all funded by foreign monarchies. Really? In America? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Scott. I mean, it, it's very unfortunate that so many of the experts that you see on, you know, whether it's CNN, Fox News, NPR, doesn't matter what 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 side you're getting your political news from. Chances are the, the expert that you're hearing from, they, they've they got some ties to some foreign money in, in some way, shape or fashion or another. And also chances are it's usually perfectly legal and they just don't tell you about it. Man. All right. Well, so what about that? I thought there was the, uh, well, and I guess there is the Foreign um, Registration Act. I, I, mm-hmm. I dropped a word from that acronym there, FARA. Um, they, uh, so they do have to register as foreign agents, but then I guess that just doesn't matter, right? That as long as their conflict of interest isn't disclosed when they're being interviewed on these big TV or radio shows or whatever it is, or writing their essays yeah. for their important... Um, you know, op-eds for newspapers and magazines and things, then who cares if they're foreign agents, right? It's a big difference. Yeah, this is where the Foreign Agents Registration Act, or or FARA, as as us nerds call it, um, it, it, it's kind of a gray area for FARA, the think tanks, that is, in that FARA has this uh, this requirement that if you are being funded, uh, you know, by a foreign entity, specifically a foreign government, and you're doing work that uh, that would benefit them, or you're doing work on their behalf, that you you do have to register uh, uh, under FARA. But for think tanks, they're they're at least think tanks think they're eligible for this exemption to FARA for what the statute calls bona fide scholastic activities. And now this is where it gets really confusing, Scott, is that I, I think in a lot of cases, some of the work that think tanks are doing is not really bona fide scholastic activity. You know, this isn't you know research that you would see in the ivory tower. In many cases, it's research that would seem to benefit directly these foreign funders that are helping to keep the lights on at these think tanks. Yeah. And then so... But they remain very objective in their analysis, though, a lot of the times, right, and advise that sometimes maybe we need to cut these monarchies off until they start holding regular democratic elections and adopt a constitution and bill of rights and stuff like that, right? (laughs) I wish, I wish. I mean, my, my, my gripe is, you know, you know, it's a free world and, you know, people are allowed to take money from, you know, whatever foreign uh, government they want to. But my gripe is that they need to be transparent about it. They need to tell folks about it. And so when, when these folks go on CNN or, you know, they're writing an article in the Wall Street Journal, let's say, just tell people that the the topic that you're writing about or that you're talking about you're funded by the people who could benefit from what you're saying. If you're candid about that with people, then I think everybody's on the up and up. It doesn't look like you're trying to to pull one over on somebody. The problem I really have 
is when these folks are trying to put themselves out as objective, you know, as a, as a purely objective expert, you know, that I don't have a stake in the game, you know, just trust me a, a, as this neutral party. Um, and then they leave out those potential conflicts of interest. That's when I, I, I think it's really problematic because they're deceiving consumers of their information. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so What's their current game here? I see this thing about they're accusing the Biden administration of tilting toward the Ayatollah. Get the hell out of here. You can't pay me enough to come up with some crap like that. <laughs> and I could really yeah. use the money, but uh, there's got to be a limit, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that's what's really problematic about it to me with like a lot of the rhetoric that we're seeing from some of these Saudi and, and UAE funded think tanks now. They're, you know, they're sort of creating this argument that I, I'm not sure is really there. Um, and they're, they're saying that these countries in the Middle East, because of Biden's negligence, the, the, the countries are turning more towards China and Russia and sort of using that as a threat to try and get the U.S. to do more of what these countries uh, would like. And it, the, the real problem I have, especially from a, a Quincy Institute perspective, where we're advocating for a foreign policy of restraint, is that a lot of what they're advocating for is, is kind of like a NATO light in the Middle East, which is to say we would have this like security cooperation agreement with some of these uh, Gulf dictatorships and we would effectively have U.S. taxpayers foot the bill for the, for the security and, and to keep U.S. military troops on foreign soil, which needless to say would be very costly, very problematic, could get the U.S. involved in God knows how many other wars in the Middle East too. So I, I think it's important for us to call out kind of th these arguments and some of the money behind it. Yeah. And, you know, for all this narrative about boo-hoo, Iran taking over the region, first of all, it was America that gave their best friends Baghdad, and it was America that mm -hmm. made the Syrian regime more reliant on Iran and Hezbollah than ever before. So they have to shut up and not complain about that. But then secondly, as soon as there was even a hint that Biden really meant the same thing. And he didn't really mean it any more than Obama did when they announced the pivot to Asia. America's not leaving the Middle East. You know, part of Middle East domination is all about controlling China's access to energy anyway. You know what I mean? We're not leaving right. the Middle East. But even when Biden seems like he kind of might be losing interest at all, we see UAE princes fly straight to Tehran. You see Saudi princelings straight to Baghdad to meet with Iranians and talk about, let's dial these tensions down, maybe even find a way to end the war in Yemen, all these things. Right. Not all hell breaks loose because America leaves, but hell s starts tightening down a little bit because these royal thugs no longer have the American superpower at their back or even seemingly are losing our support at all to get away right. with what they're getting away with, right? It's like a little bully with a big bully behind him kind of thing. Yeah, exactly right. And, 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 and I mean, to anybody who would question that, show me, show me the scoreboard where, where it's worked. We're having the, the, the U.S. be the military backers of all these dictatorships. How has that really worked for the U.S.? And, and you know, you look at it right now too, with with gas prices being the way they are, and the these Gulf countries, these oil major oil producing Gulf countries, are basically saying no to to the U.S. For on, on on efforts to try and rein in the price of gas right now. So if, if they're not even going to help us, uh, you know, rein in the price of gas for American consumers. What exactly are American taxpayers getting out of, of this deal? You know, what are we getting out of the fact that we're the big bully, the, the, the big backer for, for these dictatorships? I'm just not seeing the return on investment for, for your regular Americans with this arrangement we have now. Yeah. And uh, did this change? The last headlines I saw was that uh, Ben Nayef and Ben Salman the princelings in charge of UAE and Saudi wouldn't even take President Biden's phone calls? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you, you know, despite we're, we're talking billions of dollars in arms sales, U.S. arms sales to both Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Well, I mean, and full it, complicity in their genocide in Yemen for the last absolutely. seven years. 
Yeah, I, I, you, you beat me to it, Scott. That, that's, that's what I was going to say. Like they, they could not commit most of the atrocities they're committing in Yemen without U.S. military weaponry and U.S. military training, U.S. military support. You, you take all that away and, you know, a lot of the devastation in Yemen is just not happening. And yet, despite those billions of dollars in tens of billions of dollars in military equipment going to these countries, including armed drones going to the UAE, including F-35s, we're talking some of our most advanced military weapons. Weaponry, and they won't even take our calls. What what kind of relationship is that? You, you know, if if I'm in a relationship like that with with a girlfriend, you know, I think I dump her. <laughs> and so at some point here, when does the U.S. just say, "Well, okay, I've had enough"? Yeah, I like this sentence in your piece. The Middle East Institute did not respond to a request for comment. Well, what the <laughs> hell? How illegitimate are they? That. They just think, uh-oh, they had a meeting. Should we talk to this guy? Let's just ignore him and hope it goes away? Because what do they have to say to you in their own defense? Look, the fact that Saudi Arabia really, really, really likes what we say is just a coincidence. They happen to have really great opinions like us. That's all. Yeah, I, I I was surprised that they didn't comment. And I mean, for, for, for me, it's, it, it, you know, asking for comment is just journalistic integrity. You know, we I had a bunch of information in there. You know, I saw a pattern of things that they were saying um, and, you know, seemed seemed to me at least to be very, very clearly supportive of the goals and aims of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Um, and in all these pieces, they, they weren't mentioning their funding. And so I wanted to point that out to people. And I very much wanted them to comment on it. What I was really hoping for, Scott, honestly, was them to say, you know, a sort of mea culpa, um, you know, our apologies, you know, we're, 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 we're striving to be more transparent, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and ask that to be added to the pieces. Uh, but they didn't respond uh, at all to that request for comment, unfortunately. So uh, I guess we'll never know, you know, how they really felt. Yeah. Hey, look, we're talking, is it true? Am I reading this thing right? Tens of millions of dollars for just a little old Middle East Institute? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't, in fact, just a few years ago, in, in one fail swoop, one gift, they got $20 million from the UAE. And, you know, it helped to, to, to fill some of their senior ranks, hire staff, help to help to bolster their, their, their nice new facilities there. Um, yeah, it's, it's tens of millions of dollars um, just from the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Hmm. And by the way, are you familiar with uh, the Middle East Institute's stand on the Yemen war over the last seven years by chance? Uh, do, they, do they have a stand? No, I, I'm actually not. Uh, no, I, I don't know either, but I bet it's bad. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, I can't recall. I'm, I'm not sure, but I can't recall seeing anything that's uh, uh, extremely critical of it. But, you know, I, I, I could certainly be wrong. Yeah. Well, I just search site for Yemen and see what I can see here. Um, <laughs> and now uh, you also say in this article that the Middle East Institute is far from alone when it comes to being backed by the Saudis. And then, you know, obviously the Israelis are part of this. The Turkish lobby, at least at one time, was very powerful. I think the closer they are with the Israelis, the better for them. But can you sort of, you know, you got listeners out in Cincinnati somewhere, need a mind's eye kind of picture of just how influential these foreign lobbies are and how much sway they have in D.C. compared to, say, the American people or the arms manufacturers themselves or the, you know... Friends of Israel and all those different affinity organizations, some of them directly related to the Israeli government and many of them not. Oh, e e enormous, Scott. It's hard to put it in perspective, but I, I, I think it's fair to say that... Th these foreign governments are, are far, they're far more powerful than a lot of our domestic lobbying groups, even, even, you know, domestic in interest groups can be very powerful. But for, for these foreign lobbies, they, they, they've sort of got their tentacles in all these different pots of influ influence. They've got their lobbyists, they've got their public relations professionals working with the media. Um, in fact, they have advertising deals directly with the media uh, itself. You know, CNN in, for example, has this uh, separate Dubai Now kind of outlet that that puts out what I think are frankly puff pieces about the UAE, um, and they're under the banner of CNN because they have this arrangement with the 
UAE. Um, it goes beyond that. Like we're, we're talking about think tanks. Uh, they go into academia too. Saudi Arabia and the UAE, for example, are some of the biggest donors to America's colleges and universities. Uh, Qatar is actually the very biggest donor to America's colleges and universities. Um, so you get all these different- Wait, 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 wait. wait. Say that last thing again. Qatar is the largest uh, foreign donor to America's colleges and universities. More than China, uh, more than any other country, any other boogeyman that folks might think up, Qatar takes the cake. Uh And these foreign governments, there's not even a tradition or a moray or nothing that prevents foreign governments from just bankrolling American universities. And how much money are we talking about there? Oh, billions and billions of dollars. Actually, more than uh, the Department of Education actually tracks this. There's a for for, for your really inquisitive listeners. There's a foreign uh, foreign gifts database that the Department of Inter- uh, Education tracks, and th- they've tracked more than ten billion dollars uh, in in money coming from from foreign powers. Um, the uh, Qatar itself uh, ha- has donated more than a billion dollars of that. Mm. Um, so we're talking just huge, huge sums of money. And my, my alma mater, Texas A and M, for example. It's one of the largest recipients of Qatari money, too. Um, so even, you, you, you know, right there in Texas, where, where you're at, Scott, you're seeing this money affect right in people's backyards. It's not just in D.C. It's the point I always try to make to folks. The lobbyists and everything, sure, they're roaming the halls of Congress here. But, you know, wherever you are, chances are some of this money is flowing there. And it's very likely flowing to your local college and university. Right. Hey, after all. You know, as you say, comparing them to American lobbies, like the most powerful ones, say the NRA or the AARP or mm-hmm. Friends of Israel, that's a foreign lobby and a domestic one uh, that's still here. We're talking <laughs> about sovereign governments with budgets in the hundreds of billions of dollars a year or whatever. They can afford all this is absolute chump change to them to outrank. If you had every peace activist oh, yeah. in America, including all the millionaires, all chipping in as much as they could possibly spare. It doesn't compare to what a sovereign government can just print or borrow from China or whatever it is. Right. Right. That's exactly right, Scott. And, you know, some of the figures that, you know, I throw out to people, oh, you know, $30 million lobbying campaign. People are like, whoa, that's a lot of money. For these countries, you know, if you're Saudi Arabia, that's a rounding error in your budget. (laughs) You know, that's nothing to them. And if you can if you can spend $30 million on, on a lobbying and PR campaign, and use that to secure a, a 10 plus billion dollar arm sale package, that's a gigantic return on investment that I think anybody on Wall Street would be glad to get. And these foreign governments are getting it all the time, unfortunately. Sorry, hang on just one second. Hey guys, anybody who signs up to listen to this show by way of Patreon will be invited to join the Reddit group. And I'm gonna start posting stuff over there more. That's patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show. Thanks. Hey, y'all, LibertasBella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things, including the great Top Lobsters designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella, from the same great folks who bring you Ammo.com for all your ammunition needs, too. That's LibertasBella.com. You guys, check it out. This is so cool. The great Mike Swanson's new book is finally out. He's been working on this thing for years. And I admit, I haven't read it yet. I'm going to get to it as soon as I can. But I know you guys are going to want to beat me to it. It's called Why the Vietnam War, Nuclear Bombs and Nation Building in Southeast Asia, 1945 through 61. And as he explains on the back here, all of our popular culture and our retellings and our history and our movies are all about the height of the American war there in, say, 1964 through 1974. But how do we get there? Why is this all Harry Truman's fault? Find out in Why the Vietnam War by the great Mike Swanson. Available now. By the way, I searched the Middle East Institute site, mei.edu, for Yemen, and I found why the end the Yemen war narrative is problematic. (laughs) By... No. Nadwa all the the sorry, and he says, oh, "Boy, uh, Biden, the, the bad news, everybody. Biden has appointed this guy Lender King to try to end the war, but we got to win it first. You can't. Oh no, they're going to revoke the designation of the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization. That's problematic, Ben. So yeah, there you go. Wow. That's what." 
endless financing will buy you. It's the same thing we talk about with Russia policy too, where you have for, I guess, decades now, last couple anyway, you have all these think tanks talking about the possibility of confrontation with Russia and with China, where they just omit the word nuclear in the entire damn study. And you just, I mean, that's no way to get paid. Well, we can never fight them. We're deterred by their H-bombs. Well, then you don't get your $20,000, dude. So, you know, so nobody <laughs> writes that one. And so you have right. all these people just leave nukes out and then they have these entire war games. In fact, they had this thing on, I didn't get to watch it yet. They had a thing on um, MSNBC where they were, you know, talking about doing a war game with China here. And they act like, well, we could just sink their Navy or we could just obliterate Russia's land army. And then somehow we would not lose our hometowns over this. And you're just supposed right. to ignore the fact that everybody knows that even China, even though they only have 300, they have 300. Forget only. That's enough to destroy our entire country. And never mind what Russia could do. But then they just talk for years about, yeah, here's how we'd fight a big tank battle against Russia. I'm like, you guys are crazy. You're going to get us all killed. And, right. and look at us now. We've been fighting an avowedly proxy war, um, an avowed proxy war against mm -hmm. Russia for months now, right on their border. And it would be controversial to propose peace talks. Oh, you think we should just give in to Hitler? No, no. And, and you know, it's like it's 1962 and Jack Kennedy's refusing to send Bobby to talk to Khrushchev's guy, you know? And the <laughs> thing is completely nuts. And it's based on the idea that. Well, what are they going to do about it, I guess? Because they just refuse to consider the fact that, well, they can kill all of us is what they could do about it. And it is, and right. everybody knows this, sorry. Everybody knows this. When it comes to nuclear war, it's use them or lose them. That means as soon as the war starts, it's on. Forget it. There's no limited nuclear war with a couple of little, you know, tactical strikes here and there. Once they nuke NATO headquarters, we launch everything we've got. That's how it works. Right, right. And, and, and what's killing me, Scott, is I, I'm, in, I'm in complete agreement with you. And unfortunately, no one in Congress is saying this. I, I should say, except for one person. We, we've got this $40 billion new aid package going to Ukraine, and nobody's blinking at the number. The only person who did was, was Senator Rand Paul. And, you know, he made the controversial statement that, Maybe we should consider what's in this, and maybe we should consider the the potential risks for ex ex escalation that could come from an aid package of this size, military assistance of this size. Um, but he was on an island, and n nobody else stood there with him. Now Congress, in not debating any of these issues, not thinking about the possibility of escalation or the the, the, the nuclear weapons issue either, is just going to let this go through. And meanwhile, Russia has said publicly, Putin has announced that arms transfers are, he's considering them legitimate military targets. So we're putting U.S. soldiers directly in arms way whenever we're getting new arms to Ukraine. And so you, we may say that's, that's that we can have a debate whether that's good, bad, you know, is that, are we willing to take that risk? But nobody is even acknowledging right now that giving arms to Ukraine is a risk to the U.S. soldiers and it increases the risk of the U.S. being involved in a nuclear war with Russia. And we have to include that in our calculations here. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that uh, David Stockman and others are really on to something when they talk about the psychology of the Democrats now and how essentially now that Putin, now that Trump is gone, Putin is just a stand in for Trump. And this is just more derangement than anything. It's also, as John Mearsheimer says, mm -hmm. that when the war broke out after, you know, as the result of the coup of 2014, then of course, they couldn't admit that their coup had led to the war. So what happened was Putin turned into the devil and then, you know, bad men do bad things. And that's all you need to know about that. And so, you know, they have their narrative that is, right. they're very invested in. And of course, the entire, you know, 2016 uh, hoax of Russian meddling in the election that Democrats still aren't over, even though it never was true. Um, and so you have all that. But then seems really important to go back to your last piece that we talked about here about the Ukraine lobby where, and I believe you broke it down between the think tanks, the congressmen and the media and how mm -hmm. they just dumped in more money than the Israelis in just the last couple of years 
in order to influence. And it's just so easy to see, like, even if that's just the margin, they're all ideologically committed for whatever reasons, you know, Putin is a conservative Christian white guy and they hate that whatever is their stupid problem, you know, um, that this is the margin is all this money is that that's right. The consensus is Ukrainians, heroes, black sun and all, and, uh, and Putin's the devil in this script and that's it. And so you just have, it's such a consensus. It's unreal. I haven't seen anything like this since 20 years ago. Even during Syria, well, no, they were this stupid on Syria too. But <laughs> but this is right up there, right, with like the right. lynching of the Branch Davidians, the, the lynching of Saddam Hussein, of Bashar al-Assad, uh, with the way that they're doing, you know, rounding up this hate mob kind of mentality against the Russians now. And then, but then you have all this money coming in so that if you're a congressman, you'd be crazy to go against this right now, right? It would just be, never mind yeah. principle, it would be irrational for you to try to go against this tide, you know? Yeah, I mean, the the, the war machine is rolling right now, and uh, it's it's very tough to stop it. And and how much money are we talking about that the Ukrainians are spending on these PR firms again? Uh, the you, Ukrainians, <laughs> the Ukrainian lobbyists are kind of a cheap date. Um, and, and I say that out of affection. They, uh, <laughs> Ukrainian interests spent, uh, just over $2 million last year on their, their lobbying and PR. No, 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 but you told me they were out, out spending the Israelis and the Saudis even. Oh, I, they, they're out working. That, that, that was the other part I was going to say. Okay. They're, they, that's why I call them kind of a cheap date on K Street. Um, the, the, the Ukrainian mm -hmm. lobbyists, they, they work harder than any other lobbying, uh, lobbying team I've ever I've ever seen. You, you know, the, the Ukraine lobby last year made over 10,000 political contacts. And, and to put that put that in perspective, you know, the Saudi lobby, which which we've talked about a lot, Scott, uh, they, they contact between two and three thousand people a year. And so the Ukrainians last year, for a fraction of the price, they're, they're contacting almost four times as many people as the Saudi lobby is. So it, it's just an extraordinary advocacy campaign on, on behalf of Ukraine. Hmm. Um, but then they're also, so they're buying up, uh, they're, they're, you know, paying PR firms, but they're also donating to think tanks too. Uh, very limited. The, um, the, the think tank focus was, uh, uh primarily was, uh, at the Atlantic council, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, not surprising. It right. tends to be a, a, a sort of pro kind of NATO think tank, you know, pro tr transatlantic relations. Took the words right out of my mouth there on the not surprising guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so so the Atlanta Council does have significant funding um, for, uh, from Ukrainian interests, uh, specifically one of the oligarchs over there, uh, Viktor uh, Pinchuk. Um, and, you know, he's he's <laughs> had, he's been tangled up with Paul Manafort and, and, and other people before. Uh, and so, you know, he has he has something of an unsavory past himself. Uh, but he's given significant amounts of money to to the Atlanta Council and the, the Atlanta Council. Um, whether it's connected or not, who can say, uh, but the Atlantic council has put out a lot of very, uh, what, what I think is for a, a militarized U S response, um, to the crisis in Ukraine to include so, so some of the scholars over there are calling we're, we're very, very early on calling for the U S to implement a no fly zone in Ukraine. And this is to your point about like people not really thinking right now. And they didn't even think about like, well, what would happen next? If the U.S. were to do that, if the U.S. were to shoot down a Russian MiG, like what what would happen next? Like none of that was ever in any of the the, the articles or, or the interviews. Uh, and fortunately, the Biden administration didn't listen to the Atlantic Council on that one. Right. Yeah, that's true. You know, um, I couldn't find this footnote for the longest time. Then I found it again. It was Ambassador Ivo Dodler from 2015 being interviewed on NPR news about why we ought, why Obama's a coward for not dumping in more weapons into Ukraine after he's, you know, the first black president to sponsor a Nazi coup d'etat. Um, and then, but he was afraid to send in enough weapons. And so Ivo Dodler is telling Robert Siegel on NPR news that, yeah, so we ought to dump a bunch of javelin missiles in there. And then you know, there's only deniable Russian forces in there, you know, minimal Russian forces helping the separatists in the Donbass at that time. And so Robert mm -hmm. Siegel says, well, so then what'll happen? He goes, well, what'll happen is we'll be sending all these Russians home in, in body bags, you know? 
And then Robert Siegel goes, yeah, and then what? And he says, <laughs> well, and then that will cause the debate to go up inside Russia. The debate to go up, Ben, <laughs> to go up. And, and then you're supposed to just conclude that obviously that means that all the angry moms in Russia will blame Putin for getting their son killed rather than blaming the Americans for actually killing their son. And you're just right. supposed to just in, the, in where he says the word up, you're supposed to daydream all the rest of this crap about how this is definitely going to fill in our interests and will be contrary to Russia's interests. And then Robert Siegel's right. like, oh, okay. Okay, good. That's what we'll do. We'll kill Russian soldiers, and that will make the debate go up. Great interview, Ivo Dodler. Thank you for your <laughs> report about why we ought to dump a bunch of Lockheed products into— And, by, and oh, I was going to start claiming who else was the byline on that, but <laughs> I almost forgot. I want to make sure I'm right, so I'm not going to claim it. I think Bruce <laughs> Jackson's name was on there, wasn't it? Anyway. Yeah, they, I mean, I mean, Scott, I think that that's exactly just like ripped from the headlines today. People aren't thinking about you know, what happens next on any of these proposals. You know, whether it's the no-fly zone or, or, or arm sales. You know, what what happens next on those? Like, what's the end game for this? You know, one of my colleagues, George Beebe, lifelong intelligence guy, just had an article for Responsible Statecraft too, that was about how does this end? Where let's 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 play chess with this instead of just playing checkers or I don't know. I think we're, we're playing tic-tac-toe badly right now. So any, any advancement up would be good. But George BB asked, how does this end? And that's the way I wish more folks in Washington would start thinking about this. When we give those arms over there, how does that lead to a more peaceful resolution? And I, I frankly don't think it does, but we're not even having the debate right now. Yeah. And by the way, since I brought up, I knew I was screwing it up. It wasn't Bruce Jackson that was on there. It's Strobe Talbot, the guy who was the oh. primary leader of NATO expansion in the first place, right there with uh, Michelle Flournoy, who uh, championed the Afghan surge that completely failed and oversaw its implementation as Deputy Secretary of Defense for Policy, and Admiral James Stravridis, who would have been Secretary of Defense under Hillary Clinton, or maybe National Security Advisor, but if Maybe Flournoy would have been Secretary of Defense. But either way, he's the guy who told the New York Times in January that, yeah, we don't know anything about defeating an insurgency, but we sure know how to back one. And that's why we want to dump a bunch of weapons into Ukraine. Is they wanted to, to see the war. And we're going to replicate like we did in Afghanistan in the 1980s in Rambo 3. And we're going to replicate. He's bragging about this openly, the New York Times. We're going to replicate the dirty war in Syria under Barack Obama. You know, the one that led to the caliphate and then Iraq War Three. Yeah, we're going to do that to the Russians. And we're going to pour in not just tow missiles, but javelins and stingers. And just these people are crazy. Crazy. Yeah. You know yeah. what that's going to do? See, here's the thing, Ben. That's going to cause the debate to go up in Russia. So you can see how that's going to solve all our problems, right? Yeah. I, I, I mean, an, another thing, too, to say about all this, too, is on, on the next steps front, People forget how often in U.S. history U.S. arms are later used against U.S. troops. And we've seen this in Yemen. We've seen this in Afghanistan. We saw it in Iraq that we ship arms over there. Our, our, our enemy combatants get their hands on U.S. weapons in one way or another. And then they eventually use them to kill U.S. troops. And we're not thinking about that right now in Ukraine. We're not thinking about that at all. How, you know, if we start sending tens of billions of dollars in arms over there, what's the potential risk that these weapons could ultimately be used to kill our men and women in uniform? And I, I just wish once again that we were at least having these debates and conversations. But right now in Congress, we're absolutely not. Yeah. Well, and look, especially since the recent part of the war broke out at the end of February, they're doing everything they can to play down all the neo-Nazism of the Azov Battalion and right sector and light groups there, C-14 and these other groups. But mm -hmm. if you've been paying attention since 2014 and 15, there's no question that guys just like the guy who did the massacre at the grocery store in Buffalo the other day, a white supremacist mm -hmm. who uh, killed all these innocent black people shopping— <laughs> Uh, was wearing a big white sun logo on his chest. 
guys exactly like him have been traveling to Ukraine to fight with the Azov Battalion against the ethnic Russians in the Donbass since 2014. They've come from all over Europe and the United States. One of them, the FBI says, was at Charlottesville at the riot where the guy ran over and killed the lady and injured mm. a lot of other people. And so they just want to play this down right in the middle of the liberal Democrats back in a neo-Nazi group in uh, Ukraine. There's just no irony. They just want to pretend that, oh, oh, come on. Lots of Nazi groups use Black Sun logos. Yeah, like the Azov Battalion. I mean, what are we talking about here? This is completely crazy. This same guy could have been a moderate rebel fighting for America, fighting for the CIA in Ukraine at this exact time. Just like when you have ISIS attacks in America while we're backing them in Syria in the Obama years. This is completely nuts, man. You couldn't make this up. You know, the the truth or kooks would would swing and miss. It's just too nuts, even for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a sad state of affairs all the way around. It's completely crazy. Um, Well, listen, if we don't get all nuclear bombed to death, which I actually think is a there's a reasonable chance that that's going to happen now. Um, I hope we can talk again soon, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> God, on that cheery note, Scott, I really do look forward to talking to you again. I'm usually not that much of an alarmist, but Joe Biden's <laughs> the president right now, and we got a border war right there on Russia's western border, man. I just think that yeah. things could be better. Yeah, no, I'm 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 with you, but you know, I, I guess one, one silver lining I, I, at Quincy, we're we're trying to do our our little part to hopefully push for a peaceful resolution here. Yeah, you sure as hell are, and I'm so appreciative of uh, what you guys are doing there. And um, you know, my previous interview was with good old Ted Snyder, also writing for a responsible statecraft, and you guys are putting oh, out great, great stuff. And we, of course, are linking to it all the time at antiwar.com. So. Uh, yeah. Yes, we, we appreciate the good work. Help getting the good word out there. Oh yeah. All right. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Take care, Scott. All right, you guys. That is Ben Freeman. He is at responsiblestatecraft.org, and this one is called Gulf Funded Think Tank Turns Pro Saudi UAE Messaging Up to Eleven. The Scott Horton Show and Anti War Radio can be heard on KPFK ninety point seven FM in LA, APSRadio.com antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.